Juan Luis is an aeronautical engineer from Spain, working as a mission planning and execution engineer at Satellogic, the satellite uh, imagery company. Uh, he has been contributing to the scientific Python ecosystem for almost 10 years, and uh, he is the author of many open source packages, including Polyastro, a Python library for interactive astrodynamics. He is also a professor of Python for data science in several uh, different business schools and a freelance consultant for R&D projects in the aerospace industry. And for today's talk, um, are you really tired of squinting at punched cards to find out about the orbit of your satellite? I know I am. So pay attention to this talk and find out everything about how the future works for orbits. Thank you very much, Pieros. So hello, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. Thanks to the organizer for this uh, wonderful event that is working so well. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the past and the present and how the future should look like. So the outline of the, of the talk is uh, like this. So we're going to describe a little bit what is a TLE exactly and more specifically what is not a TLE. We're going to discuss a little bit what problems do TLEs have and why should we stop using them as soon as possible now that we have alternatives. We're going to talk a little bit about what's the new proposed format, so OMMs, uh, Orbit Mean Element Messages. Some details to consider though, uh, based on my very short experience uh, investigating this format and some of its current shortcomings. And then we're going to go over um, some findings that um, we were researching into what's the current status of OMM support in the open source ecosystem, which is part of work that we're doing for the OpenSatcom initiative. And then we will go to the conclusions and uh, Q&A. So I hope that you have lots of questions about this one. And so what's a TLE in the first place? Well, this is a contested question. I ran a poll on Twitter before doing this talk, and this was by far my favorite answer. So a zombie data encoding system dating back to the punched card days with an amazing year 2056 problems, among other issues. So definitely this was my favorite response. A good summary, but not very insightful though. Um, there has been people all around the world confused by TLEs, and in fact, you can see this excerpt from one interview to one of the presidential candidates of the US elections. This is 100% real, of course. And this was the face of the interviewer when seeing a TLE. So as you can imagine, this is uh, pretty confusing already. So what you have in front of you right now looks like a TLE, but it's not. And I want to give you a, a very important warning here. This TLE stands for two line element. And what I'm showing on screen has three lines. So first of all, we have to get the arithmetic right. So what we have here is a 3LE and not a TLE. But anyway, despite this uh, nitpick about the format, a TLE is um, a representation of the orbit that is very compact, that has uh, both a representation of the mean elements of the orbit, as well as some extra numerical information that's used to understand how the orbit changes uh, with time. And it's usually a product of uh, a set of observations as we're going to see next. So in the words of the author of Cellstrack, um, TLEs or two-line element sets are a way to, are a way that the US government uses to provide general perturbations orbital data. Okay, and what does this general perturbations part mean? mean? So very short and very quickly, what this means is that um, the osculating orbit that would be described by the two-body problem and the equations that Kepler and Newton discovered centuries ago is never the actual path that the satellites uh, take in orbit. And in fact, there are a lot of perturbations that have an effect over this, over this orbit, which are summarized in lots of different textbooks that you can find. This is a screenshot from my favorite one, Vallao. And there are several effects like the non-sphericity of the Earth, the atmospheric drag, 
uh, higher order terms of the gravitational field and thermal effects from the moon, uh, solar radiation pressure, the tides, and so forth. So we need some sort of way to compress all this orbital information and understand uh, how can we propagate this orbital information into the future. And that's what TLDs are. So, so far, ah, sorry, and as I was saying, this uh, general perturbations orbital data are generated by fitting a set of observations. And in the case of TLEs that are distributed through uh, Celestrack and other public channels that we will mention later on, uh, this orbit uh, information is generated by observations from the 18th Space Control Squadron, which is part of the US Air Force. So it's some sort of public service that and the US Army does for the rest of the world. And as I was saying, these elements are distributed in, in several places, and the, arguably the most popular of them is Celestrack, which is this one that you have in front of you. And this one distributes TLEs in an uh, open way, so you don't even have, you don't even need a registration for it. And they're tracking most of the visible satellites, if not all of them, as, as well as uh, debris, objects, and so forth. Okay, so that was about TLEs. So what problems do TLEs have? And why should we stop using them? And the answer is that they have quite a few. And so the first one is that by the very limitation of the format of the TLEs, there are some numerical errors that are introduced because of the limitation in uh, decimal places uh, that are used for the quantities. So for example, this is again uh, an excerpt from uh, Fundamentals of Astrodynamics and Techniques, which is a very good book uh, that I recommend you to check it out. So as it's said here, by the limitation of the decimal places that they use for the angles, there's an error introduced for LEO, so lower earth orbit satellites of about six meters, and for a geosynchronous orbit, uh, about 35 meters. Of course, this is uh, very small compared to other measurement errors and the fitting error of the TLE itself and so forth. But for precise orbit determination, this is uh, not ac acceptable by any standards. And also, why use a format that already imposed this kind of numerical error and while we don't have any more this uh, uh, space limitations and bandwidth limitations and so forth. But then the other one is that, which is also related to the um, limitation in decimal places, there are two things here that have a very big problem. One of them is the year, which is this one that I'm highlighting here, these two characters here. And the other one is the satellite number, which is these five numbers that you can see here. So about the year, um, as you can imagine, having only two characters must have been very fun in the year 2000. And the decision that they took is that for years, um, sorry, for pairs of digits that are less than 57, we assume that it's in the year 2000. So for example, if we see here uh, 01, that would be for the year 2001, but uh, for pairs of digits that are above 57, then we assume that we're talking about the 19s. So in this case, as you can see here, this old TLE has the digits 86, and therefore this corresponds to 1986. And this has an obvious problem because when we arrive to year 2057, uh, we will not be able to use this representation anymore without making some sort of adjustment. And then again, this uh, NORAD catalog number, which is these five numbers here, again, has an obvious limitations because when we pass the mark of uh, 100,000 objects being tracked by the uh, Department of Defense, uh, we will not be able, again, to use this sort of uh, representation. You will think that this mark is sort of uh, far away into the future, but the truth is that thanks to some improvements that the US has been doing in tracking both of satellites and of debris objects, uh, they're increasing the size of the catalog pretty quickly. So it's very likely that 
uh, were about to reach this limitation. And besides, uh, they found uh, an alternative solution in this case, which is uh, introducing what they call an alpha 5 numbering scheme, which probably means that they're going to uh, introduce letters as well as numbers to increase the number of objects that can be tracked uh, by the system. But again, this is uh, just a workaround for a format that is already too old, that has numerical limitations, and that is uh, too difficult for humans to read. So, with all these things, what is the new proposed format? So, OMMs. So, let's talk a little bit about it. OMMs are the bright future, and in fact, they, they're not uh, so new. This uh, new format has been around for already some years, and we're going to discuss about this uh, right next. But in May 2020, so just a few months ago, Celestrack, the website that publishes all the TLEs, announced that they're going to switch to this new OMM format to distribute this general perturbation orbital data. They're going to keep both for uh, backwards compatibility purposes and not to break everyone's software, because we know that these things take some time, but they're still encouraging everybody to uh, use uh, these new formats. So again, these uh, OMMs were standardized by the CCSDS, which is the standardization body that we all know and love. And to give you a brief, uh, sorry, to give you a quick uh, overview of where they stand in the uh, hierarchy of formats standardized by CCSDS, Orbit mean elements messages, OMMs, are part of the orbit data messages, which also comprise other two formats, orbit parameter messages and orbit ephemeris messages. And they're all part of navigation data messages, which also include attitude data messages and tracking data messages. So we're at the moment focused on this part over here. This is how they look like. So instead of having this compressed format um, with uh, character limit for all the fields, we can have this sort of representation that includes the name of the keywords. One minute so, left. Thank you. So like eccentricity, mean motion, and all the rest of uh, mean elements. And also some metadata, like what's the name, who was the producer, and so forth. Here I took a couple of screenshots from Celestrack of how to obtain this kind of format. And you see that you can get this both in JSON and in XML. I'm going to mention this very quickly because I'm already about out of time. But the interesting thing about the standard is that only XML and an ASCII format are actually standardized. The JSON format was not standardized anywhere. So it's just a translation that we do from the name of the keywords that appear in the standard. And also this XML format is not exactly in the standard that defines the OMMs, but it's in another one. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip that. And about the OMM support in the open source ecosystem, my one line summary would be that it could be better, but also could be worse. We're about to publish these findings as part of the uh, open satcom initiative but i can give you the summary already so we surveyed several open source libraries python sgp4 orchid and then some others that are not so well known and um, and i found like only one library that can read both key value notation and xml which are the two uh, notations standardized and then the rest have some mixed uh, support for all the rest of the formats this one here was discovered uh, like one week after I finish the report. So I'm going to add this uh, as an extra. And in general, I think it's uh, quite limiting that we don't have like a good way to support uh, these formats in well-known libraries like Python SGP4, and also that we don't have two-way conversion between TLEs and OMMs, unfortunately. So in conclusion, it's already time to switch away from TLEs, but uh, the support for the format in the open source ecosystem is not so widespread as I would like, at least. 
A two-way conversion between the old and the new format seems to be missing from what I understand. And also that XML is um, kind of, yeah, sorry. So, and also that XML um, is a little bit contested because some keywords that appear to be mandatory uh, cannot be filled with total accuracy from the producers. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to hear your questions. Thank you, Juan. Uh, let's see what questions do we have on the channels. So, Leonard uh, Dieg Diegas, uh, he's asking, do you want to use the mic or I read the question? That's the limit to uh, uh, 100,000 objects. I think you partially answered that. Um, how many Starlink yep. sets are going up? <laughs> I don't remember the last number. I think they count by the tens of thousands in their plans, like the last failings that they did for the Federal Communication Commission. But I'm not 100% sure about this. And also, like this is an aspiration, of course. It's not the current reality. But they already have a few hundred of them, right? I lost count, to be honest. Yeah, so the the TLEs, I mean, it, the question really was a, was kind of a you know, sarcastic. It's the hundred thousand. We're going to blow through that very. You know, if we haven't already, um, real quickly with Starlink, because they their plans for their system is like sixty thousand or something like that. You know, you, you know, so okay. or more. Okay. And remember, those are kind of disposable. I think they're just uh, their mission is just a few years. They come back down. They send another one up. You know, and so they're going to go. They're going to blow through the the numbering scheme really quick. Good. We have yeah. another question. Uh, Jan Maas is asking uh, about a numerical accuracy in the OMM. Please yes. Please uh, close the webcam. Uh, Thanks. It's a good question. In principle, OMM and TLE are just formats to represent general perturbation data and therefore they have like the same accuracy or to be better put the propagations have the same accuracy because they are supposed to be propagated with the same algorithm which is called SGP4 and what I mentioned at the beginning is that as TLEs have a limitation in how many decimal places they store they already introduce some and numerical differences just by the way they store the data, but still they are much smaller than the propagation errors anyway. So we have a question from YouTube. Um, Jan is asking, um, first of all, he says, great talk. And uh, what would be the best place to find information around the new format? I suppose the standard itself, right? But also regarding the adoption. Well, regarding the adoption, I hope that the report that we're about to publish would be the best way yeah. to look at it, uh, I hope. And also that I hope that it can be a living document, right? That we can like improve it as long as there are more um, uh, libraries supporting it. And regarding the format itself, yes, I agree that the standard is uh, it's not super hard to read, like it's a normal document after all, it's long, but uh, it contains all the information firsthand, so I would recommend you to go there. It's publicly available, you don't need to pay. It. And we have another question about why isn't there a single way to load OMMs in Python and why the effort seems to be spread uh, among different libraries? It's a good question. I was wondering the same thing while doing the, the report. I'm not sure about why I think um, you know the library that everybody or most people are using to propagate TLEs, which is Python SGP4. Um, Brandon Rhodes, his author, wants to maintain it as simple as possible, and in particular, he doesn't want or is not very interested in, in supporting XML. And I can totally understand the reasons. And there, there has been some effort, like to add import functions and export functions, but I think the community hasn't realized that we really need to move away from TLEs until the sales track announcement from May this year, which was like, what, six months ago? So 
I think it's uh, just a question of time. Like when we start feeling the pressure, we will get to it and maybe create the one single library that we should use to convert to and from TLEs and OMMs. And uh, I think a final question, if we have time, uh, what is the max number of satellites that the new format supports? In principle, I don't think there are any limitations in that because it's not constrained by the number of characters, so it should be unbounded, I think. Cool. And uh, quickly, final one, uh, is there a tutorial for using and forming OMMs or um, just we have to rely on the standard? You know, for using OMMs, it's as simple as loading them with your library of choice. Refer to my previous slide where I was showing which libraries you can use. And then they are propagated in the same way as TLEs, and they produce a Cartesian result in the uh, true equator mean equinox frame, like uh, it was before. And about forming the OMMs, um, I think the standard itself would be, again, the, the, the primary guide, and I don't think there's a tutorial out of it, um, but maybe we could produce one as well. Who knows? Cool. And I think that would be all for this talk. Thanks a lot, Juan. That was super interesting, and I think that the conversation can also continue on the um, later on the day.